Hello and welcome to this uh, Institute of International and European Affairs event, which is part of the IAA's Global Project, Global Europe Project, supported uh, by the Department of Foreign Affairs. My name is David O'Sullivan. I'm the Director General of the Institute, and I'm particularly delighted today to be joined by my good friend and colleague, Stefano Sanino, Secretary General of the European External Action Service, who has been generous to take time out from his busy schedule on a lightning, lightning visit to Dublin today to speak with us. Uh, he will speak to us for about 15 or 20 minutes or so, and we will then go to a question and answer with your audience. Uh, you'll be able to join the discussion using the by now very familiar Q and A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Uh, and please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll come to them uh, once uh, Secretary General Sanino has finished his presentation. I should remind you that uh, both today's presentation and the question and answer uh, are both on the record. And please feel free, as always, to join uh, our discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We're also live streaming today's discussion, uh, um, so a very warm welcome to all of you tuning in via YouTube. Let me just formally now say a few words uh, about Secretary General Sanino before I hand him the floor. Uh, he has served as the Secretary General of the European External Action Service since January 19, 2021. <laughs> Uh, and was Deputy Secretary uh, for Economic and Global Issues at the External Action Service from April 2020 to December 2020. He has a very distinguished uh, career in the Italian Diplomatic Service, uh, also in the European Commission. Uh, we worked together when he was Diplomatic Advisor to President Prodi uh, as President of the Commission. He then was also his Diplomatic Advisor when he was Prime Minister, and he has served as um, uh, Italian ambassador uh, to Spain, to the uh, permanent representative of Italy to the EU, and he's also been a director general in the commission. So he has wide experience of national diplomacy, uh, European diplomacy, uh, and uh, could not be better qualified to, to take on the role he has today. So uh, please, Stefano, uh, the floor is yours. David, thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, the warm welcome. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, um, share uh, the screen with you. Um, um, uh, for uh, those who don't know, David has been my first boss when I joined the uh, European Commission. So he was my secretary general <laughs> at the time. Um, and so it's uh, an enormous pleasure to, uh, uh, to share the, uh, um, uh, the screen with him. And thanks to the uh, um, IIEA for uh, uh, hosting me. Um, maybe um, uh, I know that it's a little bit uh, um, uh, intuitive, but I cannot uh, um, start this um, this meeting and, 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 and this this chat without um, uh, mentioning what is the biggest challenge that maybe the European Union is facing um, uh, in his recent in the last few years. And that's the, uh, um, uh, the aggression, the war of aggression of Russia against Ukraine. Um, this has been, uh, a, from many points of view, a sort of watershed because the European Union had to decide between uh, accepting uh, what could be a, a, a seen, and it is a blatant violation of all the principles uh, for which we have been uh, uh, fighting for decades following the, the Second World War or um, uh, close ranks and uh, uh, confront this challenge. And um, uh, it's, this is exactly what happened. Uh, um, I still remember very well the um, European Council that followed the uh, um, invasion of Ukraine and the uh, sense of um, unity and determination that all the leaders expressed in the context of, the, um, um, of that council which really paved the way then for a number of uh, uh, not easy decisions um, uh, that have been uh, um, all underpinned by this very strong will. And I would say that since that moment, uh, I can identify two uh, main features that have marked our approach to, the, uh, um, uh, to this crisis. And that is unity and partnership. Um, unity, I, as I was saying, um, we have been uh, since the very beginning very clear that we had to uh, um, act in a unified way 
and that it would have been our uh, major asset in order to uh, confront the uh, threat and that was coming from, uh, um, from China. Um, I, maybe I start with the saying uh, about the one point that is also very sensitive for you in, uh, here in, in Ireland, that is the fact that the European Union has hosted more than 7 million um, Ukrainian refugees. And that, um, from that point of view, also Ireland has um, um, done an important part of the job since it more than 1% uh, of its population of um, um, refugees is coming from um, uh, Ukraine. And this is a solidarity, uh, which I think is extremely um, uh, important. But we have been able also to support uh, um, Ukraine from the uh, economic, uh, financial, uh, political, and military point of view in a way which has been unprecedented. Um, uh, I will come back in a moment about the uh, use, for example, of the European Peace Facility for um, uh, supporting militarily Ukraine, especially at the beginning of, um, of the conflict, but also the uh, um, larger amounts of uh, um, uh, financial resources that we provide Ukraine, almost 8 billion uh, in, in these six months. Um, without considering the, uh, um, the political decision to uh, grant the candidate status to, uh, um, to Ukraine uh, and so open, paving the way for a possible future membership of the, uh, the country to uh, uh, the European Union. At the same time, um, um, we have also imposed a, a, um, an unprecedented set of sanctions against um, Russia. Um, and we have substantially uh, worked on isolating uh, Russia on, uh, um, on the world scene. Um, we are uh, working also very closely together on the global implications of um, this conflict, especially when it comes to the triple crisis, the uh, energy, food, and financial crisis that, is, um, um, that we are going through I mean, uh, as a um, um, European Union, but also all the other countries of the world. And, uh, um, and we are at the same time pursuing the accountability of Russia, uh, because we think that this is part of a possible uh, definition of the conflict. And uh, um, uh, working uh, in for uh, the uh, reconstruction effort that we will need to uh, um, shoulder at the moment when uh, the uh, um, the war will be over. I'm unfortunately uh, uh, convinced that uh, um, we will see uh, more things uh, um, in, ahead of us. The uh, um, uh, phone call that has taken place between the uh, defense minister of Russia with some of his uh, Western colleagues, uh, France, uh, UK, US, um, uh, is worrying not only about the uh, um, allegations of um, uh, use of the dirty bomb, but also because we have seen that many times Russia has started accusing uh, um, Ukraine of doing the things that they themselves then uh, would do. So um, certainly an element of um, uh, preoccupation. Uh, the second point that I think I, I want to uh, stress in this context is the, uh, uh, the fact that we have managed to uh, um, enhance substantially our partnership, and, and uh, this has been also another element of, uh, of strength. Um, uh, starting with the um, with US, I would say, but also with a number of other key allies uh, in, uh, in Europe and outside Europe, and in uh, um, close contact with the um, Ukrainian authorities, um, we have been uh, uh, um, able to uh, uh, create the conditions for, uh, let's say, this, the policy that um, um, I was trying to define before of isolation of Russia and uh, um, of sanctions. And the, uh, um, uh, I think that the, uh, the work on sanctions is particularly noticeable. Um, um, we started early enough, we, in the sense, to the uh, European Union, together with the United States, um, UK, and other partners, early enough at the beginning of December, we were not sure whether the uh, um, uh, Russia would have invaded um, um, uh, Ukraine. They were denying it, but um, we thought it was important to, uh, um, to prepare the ground and work. And as a matter of fact, this has allowed us uh, to uh, um, 
impose sanctions and to agree on, on sanctions very rapidly after the um, uh, start of, um, of the conflict. Um, the other thing which I think it's important in, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to stress is the fact that we have managed to uh, um, strengthen our resilience uh, and um, um, our uh, role on, um, on the global stage. Um, and we have done this in uh, three key areas. Uh, the first one is the uh, work that we have developed on uh, security and defense. Um, this is a work that we had started already before um, um, with the idea of uh, reinforcing uh, um, our security and defense capacities. Um, you may remember that um, uh, we have launched already um, uh, some months ago, the uh, strategic compass, which is the new doctrine for the uh, security and defense of the uh, European Union, and that could um, uh, pave the way of um, um, uh, the work that we should do uh, uh, in the coming years within the European Union. Um, following the war, uh, uh, a number of decisions have been taken by uh, um, our member states. And, uh, first and foremost, I would say the decision of Finland and Sweden to apply to join NATO, but also uh, the decision of Denmark to uh, join the EU defense cooperation, and um, the decision which is taken by many countries in Europe to uh, increase if, if the defense spending. Um, because we have all realized that unfortunately uh, the uh, security uh, uh, should have been strengthened on, on our continent. And it is in this context that I um, um, uh, would like to uh, um, remind the uh, um, commitment to use the European Peace Facility um, to finance the uh, military equipment for the Ukrainian army. Uh, that was an absolute premiere up until uh, uh, February, when the decision was taken, uh, the European Union had never financed the uh, acquisition of lethal weapons, and that was the case, and we have done uh, in a quite substantial way. Uh, so far, we have committed 3.1 billion euro to uh, um, uh, support the um, for military assistance to the, uh, uh, to the Ukrainians. But I would say that more than this, it's even more relevant to the political signal that was given. It was not only the money that was important, but also the fact that the European Union collectively had undertaken uh, the, and taken the decision to uh, uh, support militarily Ukraine. We are continuing to do so. Now we are establishing also a military assistance mission to coordinate and support the training uh, needs of the Ukrainian armed forces. And all this on the top of the uh, bilateral assistance uh, um, given by the, um, um, our member states. Um, the second uh, uh, element that I would like to stress uh, is the, uh, um, the capacity of projecting uh, a, um, what I would say, our economic strength. Uh, because the sanctions that we have adopted are definitely unprecedented um, in terms of um, um, size and um, um, impact. And um, um, there is one decision uh, uh, that is part of, uh, of this process that we have taken, and that's the decision to uh, end our dependency on uh, Russian energy, which is a, a real game changer from uh, uh, many points of view. Um, sanctions and the uh, uh, decoupling in the energy sector uh, uh, do represent a, sig a significant uh, um, uh, impact on uh, the um, uh, Russian economy and will have a significant impact on the Russian economy over time. Um, the, uh, uh, the third element that I would like to uh, um, um, to uh, stress is the, the point of the enhancement of the uh, European Union uh, impact, geopolitical impact in uh, in landscape, uh, uh, in a world landscape that is changing very um, rapidly. Um, certainly, uh, this war has accelerated a, a number of geopolitical trends uh, in, uh, in world politics. And the result is that um, 
we are all living now in a much more um, uh, confrontational and fragmented system, and um, I would say even a, a more polarized uh, um, a system, a much more polarized world. Um, uh, last month, we have tried to uh, um, um, uh, reach out uh, to a number of um, um, uh, countries bilaterally and also multilateral partners uh, in order to uh, uh, try to uh, take care of a number of preoccupations uh, that uh, these countries were expressing. It is true that this war has had a number of consequences on, uh, on the third country, not only on the European Union, but also on um, countries in Africa or in Asia or in, um, in, in Latin America. And we are trying to uh, um, uh, denounce the uh, um, Russia's instrumentalization of um, food, energy, hunger, and we will continue to uh, um, counter these narratives that we think divert the attention for which are the real causes and responsibilities um, um, of the um, uh, of Russia in this in this war. Um, but we need also to uh, um, uh, make it clear to uh, all these countries that it is not only a question of um, um, the way Russia is telling the story, it's also a question of how we are able to uh, um, respond to the preoccupations that uh, these countries are expressing, how we can uh, uh, better focus uh, our work. And I'm thinking in particular to a, a number of instruments that we have developed uh, in uh, um, these last few months and uh, uh, more than everything else to Global Gateway, which is our interconnectivity strategy, that may be a, um, an important factor in uh, uh, changing the perception of the way we work with, um, uh, with third countries. Um, maybe uh, one, uh, one few words on uh, um, on china because i think that uh, uh, we are this is the um, the other big challenge that we have uh, um, in front of us um you may remember that in back in 2019 we have uh, um, developed a strategic outlook on china where we're defining this country as a, um, a partner a competitor and a systemic rival um, but it is also true that uh, uh, the, uh, the war in, uh, um, in Ukraine and uh, uh, the new political situation in China has made uh, um, China emerge as a much more assertive uh, uh, political actor. Um, there is a, a Termination on the China side to continue challenging uh, uh, the uh, leadership uh, uh, presented by the United States, and, and they are um, uh, signaling clearly that they will um, uh, uh, become strong competitors, especially on, from the technological and economic point of view. But also, we uh, need to look at the, um, uh, the vision that China um, is bringing to uh, uh, the development of the world when it comes to. Um, I mean, no, this is their security initiative or their development initiative or the way they are dealing with the rules of multilateralism um, or the vision about um, uh, human rights. So a number of elements which are making uh, China a, a real global competitor uh, from the economic but also from the political point of view. And uh, without considering the challenges that uh, um, uh, the uh, issue of the relationship with the um, uh, with Taiwan is posing, um, so we will need to uh, uh, manage this complex relationship. We will need to uh, um, uh, be able to uh, um, um, work with uh, and, and trade and keep on uh, um, developing links with a country that is. Uh, essential uh, for uh, dealing with our uh, uh, big challenges from climate change to health or to debt restructuring with a country with which we have a very substantial uh, um, exchange. It's more than uh, 1.8 billion uh, euro per day. And, uh, um, but a country at the same time is also representing, as I was saying, an alternative uh, a model for, uh, um, for uh, um, uh, the world. 
Um, and we need to be able to um, uh, make it sure that uh, the um, dependencies that we have developed over time with China cannot become vulnerabilities for uh, our systems. And um, um, so we will need to, uh, uh, to continue working in areas um, uh, that David, you know very well, I mean, where you are of, of your um, um, areas of, special, of specialization, the um, screening of foreign direct investment, um, uh, the economy, anti-economic coercion measures, uh, but also um, measures that are uh, uh, increasing our capacity to stand on our feet in uh, the future. And that's, for example, the CHIPS Act or the EU uh, batteries um, um, regulations or the work that we are doing on uh, the critical um, uh, raw materials. So we need to uh, uh, make it sure that, again, uh, um, uh, the interdependence does not become an element of um, uh, vulnerability and uh, um, of weakness for, uh, for us in, uh, in the future. Um, one final uh, um, consideration um, uh, from what I've tried to uh, define the, the, the challenges that we are facing in, uh, in Russia and between Russia and Ukraine, the ramification that these have in uh, all continents from Africa to uh, Latin America to uh, um, uh, Asia, the problems that we have in managing the, uh, the relationship with China. All this gives us a sense uh, of the fact that the, um, um, uh, the security theater is one. We are not. We are. We cannot no longer speak about alternatives, uh, um, um, security scenarios. You uh, may remember at a certain point um, um, we were more on the transatlantic agenda. Other times we were more pivoting to Asia. Um, the truth is that um, uh, we have now one single security uh, zone and that the, um, um, the link between the different agendas are much stronger than uh, um, they used to be uh, um, in the past. And it is also in this context that um, um, the work that we will uh, keep on doing on multilateralism uh, continues to be um, um, of key importance. And I'm speaking here in a country which is a champion of multilateralism, uh, it has done great work during this two years uh, sitting in, uh, in, uh, in the Security Council um, and where uh, um, uh, the effort that we will all need to make is to um, um, uphold the principles of the United Nations. This is not only a romantic uh, um, willingness, it's uh, not only the idea of a, uh, the fact of, um, uh, of having a world which is at peace with itself, but it's on the contrary, um, um, the United Nations do represent the, the place where um, uh, the use of force, the strength uh, uh, of each country, uh, finds uh, limits and counterbalances uh, um, uh, in a context which is based on rules and not on the law of the strongest. And that's where um, um, we need, I think, collectively uh, uh, to keep on working to preserve this space, which is a space of um, a freedom for uh, uh, the whole of us, for not only for uh, the West, but also for the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Stefan. That's quite a, a, a tour d'horizon there of <laughs> immense, immense challenges. Uh, and by and large, I, I, I personally would share your, your, your sort of positive assessment of the way the EU has reacted. But let me, let me just play devil's advocate for a moment. <laughs> Uh, and 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 push you on 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 a couple of those points. I mean, yes, we have maintained unity, but is it not also true that uh, we have seen uh, fairly clear disagreements about how to react to this situation, particularly between, I would say, east and west, uh, with the the Baltics and and Poland and other countries taking a much tougher line, and indeed openly fairly critical of the position taken. By countries traditionally in the lead, for example, Germany. Uh, it's true that 
Uh, this has given a boost to our defense activities, but has it not also reinforced the primacy of NATO and the um, the transatlantic role in, in defense rather than uh, uh, an autonomous or an independent European defense capability. And finally, on the global, I mean, yes, I think we have managed to rally a fairly impressive number of countries uh, in the United Nations in support of our general position. On the other hand, we have seen some fairly important countries uh, um, outside of, of Europe and the transatlantic space take a, a rather more distant view. I mean, China, obviously, but we'll come back to China in a moment, but uh, India, uh, South Africa, uh, even, even Brazil, uh, countries not really taking, wanting to get involved or take too many sides, which is, is perhaps uh, discouraging for us. So <laughs> sorry to be, but just to, to, to put the counterfactual there, maybe that, uh, you know, <laughs> things, things are more complicated than it seems. Huh? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm not trying to uh, uh, describe a sort of uh, ideal world, but um, um, the European Union uh, is certainly made of uh, uh, different interests and, and different positions. And uh, the, uh, but what is important is that at the end of the day, uh, you have a recomposition of this interest in a sort of um, um, uh, unitary line. And that's what it has happened. I think that um, um, it's also normal. Eh? I, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, the perception of the threat uh, um, of Russia is different if you are uh, living in a country bordering Russia or if you're living in a country which is not bordering Russia and has always had a very um, uh, constructive and positive trade relationship with this country. So I would say that this is part of the, uh, um, um, of the story and uh, um, I've been witnessing very in, in the European Council very interesting questions on this. But again, the point is that um, even if maybe one could start from different uh, uh, positions, what is important that you get into a middle ground, which is shared by everybody, and that um, um, everybody is uh, ready to uh, defend. And that's what has happened, uh, um, as a matter of fact. Um, on, uh, on defense, um, there too, I am a little bit more, I would be a little bit more nuanced. I mean, uh, first of all, I think that there has never been on the EU side any idea or intention to replace NATO as the military alliance or as the main provider of security in, in the European continent. We have always said that um, NATO is and will remain the, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the basis on which um, uh, the security on the continent of the continent is based, but at the same time, uh, um, I think that we have shown, and I was trying to uh, uh, to stress this point, that the European Union is able to do things in uh, specific circumstances. When we uh, uh, decide to use the European Peace Facility and so to uh, finance essentially in the um, uh, armament, the supply of armaments to uh, Ukraine and uh, the, uh, um, to take collective responsibility as European Union for that, that was not a light decision. Eh? We were not sure about the consequences of the, um, um, this choice, if Russia would have reacted uh, in a certain way, um, if we would have been considered as part of the, um, the conflict. So there were a number of, uh, of elements. And it was a situation where, uh, um, uh, for different reasons, uh, uh, there was no other security structure in, in Ukraine. Uh, remember that it's both uh, NATO and the United States had, let's say, uh, uh, moved on the uh, eastern flank of NATO and made very clear that um, that would have been the, the sort of um, um, uh, line uh, that could not be trespassed. Um, and we did it, and uh, we took our responsibility. So I think that uh, also from that point of view, um, there has been a, a, a positive and constructive uh, um, uh, uh, interlocking element, a mutually reinforcing uh, uh, dimension, uh, because it is also true that the European Union could be so bold 
in this stand because all the members or at least a large number of members of the European Union were also members of NATO. There was a sort of uh, uh, protection that was coming from, uh, from there. Um, but uh, again, I don't think that the uh, European Union will ever become a military alliance. Uh, and uh, I don't think that we need to, uh, again, to start the competition with NATO. Um, I keep on insisting on the fact that um, uh, we need to be clear that the enemy, if I can call it so, or at least the, uh, the, the uh, worrying part of the story, it's not uh, you for NATO or NATO for you, but it's for both organizations, you and NATO, third countries that are trying to uh, uh, challenge the, uh, uh, the order in which that we collectively have created after the Second World War. Um, on your third point concerning the, um, um, uh, let's say, third countries, it is true. I mean, uh, even if the, uh, the last voting was uh, um, uh, in General Assembly was extremely positive, 143 that had voted in favor of, uh, in, sorry, against the uh, uh, illegal annexation of the, uh, um, the regions to Russia. Um, it is also true that uh, there are some uh, important countries, and you have mentioned some, that um, um, have abstained and that have preferred not to uh, uh, take a more uh, clear stand. Um, I think that the, uh, if you analyze the, uh, this, the reasons behind this um, uh, position, um, you can find a number of uh, um, elements which are, um, um, again, understandable from the uh, political point of view. Uh, um, um, my reading is that, uh, uh, first of all, we should avoid um, uh, uh, dividing the world between those who are in favor and those who are against. Uh, I think that they, again, we have to take into account the complexity. And if you see also the different patterns in different kind of resolutions that um, um, have been passed in the, in the General Assembly, um, you can see that according to the topic, uh, uh, there is there are different configurations. So we need to be more granular, maybe in 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 the analysis, but we need also to uh, um, to take into account the um, complexity of um, of the relations with um, with third country. We will continue, and that was I was saying in we we'll continue. Let's say trying to uh, debunk the false narrative that uh, Russia is trying to impose, but we will we'll also try to uh, um, uh, show and prove the goodwill and determination of the uh, European Union to work constructively with, um, uh, with countries that we believe uh, have an interest in uh, working more closely with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I must not abuse my position as a moderator <laughs> all the questions. So I'll I'll turn to some questions from the audience. Um, Bridget Laffin, Professor Bridget Laffin, uh, uh, asked the following question. Uh, you have stressed that developments have been unprecedented with EU unity. How have the EU institutions worked collectively to achieve this in a crowded arena? The European Council, the General Affairs Council, the EES, the Commission, etc. Um, who, who takes the lead on what? How is unity and action secured? Um, look, I have to say that the, um, uh, especially in, uh, in developing sanctions, uh, uh, the work uh, among the institutions uh, has been almost exemplary. Um, we have been able to um, sit uh, around the same table uh, to share the work, to uh, um, do each on each side what needed to uh, to be done. Um, I think that the uh, expertise of the, uh, I mean, the, the political, if you want, the political cloud, the political landscape uh, um, that we have tried to uh, um, uh, provide for all the, uh, um, the institutions, the uh, expertise of the uh, commission in uh, um, uh, in defining the uh, the sanctions packages, both in the uh, 
a trade component as in the um, financial components or in the energy, I mean, in all these areas where the, uh, uh, the, 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 the experience of the commission is uh, invaluable and necessary. And the uh, determination of the council, the rapidity with which the uh, decisions have been taken uh, and the um, um, generosity, if I may say, call it this way, in terms of time uh, uh, that we have devoted and dedicated to this file. So I think that for me, uh, it has been a very uh, uh, um, positive uh, uh, test case that when uh, there is a real uh, uh, important um, uh, issue to be, uh, to be decided, the institutions are able to put on the side their, uh, uh, let's say, usual uh, um, the dynamic, I would say, dialectics <laughs> that is characterizing <laughs> the work of the institutions and uh, try to produce results, uh, concrete results for the interest of the uh, um, of the European citizens. So um, uh, that for me has been a, a very, very, very positive surprise. I, I, based on my experience, I would agree with you. <laughs> um, uh, so, no, obviously, one of the concerns is, you know, where where is all this war in 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 Ukraine leading? Um, uh, how long is it going to last? And and obviously the fear of escalation. Uh, uh, you mentioned the recent phone call by the, the Russian defense minister, clearly um, setting up a potential accusation, doubtless false, against Ukraine of of, a, of a, using nuclear weapons, but perhaps um, can you know revealing that 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 thought might be in the mind of of Russia. And we have a question from one of our researchers here, Kian Fitzgerald. With Russia threatening the use of a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine, how might the EU respond to the detonation of a nuclear device? And are there preparations in place for such a possibility? Uh, I know there's a limit to how much you can answer that question, but still, uh, your, your boss, uh, the high representative, was was fairly outspoken on the issue uh, uh, last week. My boss was outspoken. That's the privilege of the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, now, joking apart, I think that the, um, um, especially when it comes to nuclear, eh, the, uh, the main point of nuclear is the uh, deterrence effect. I mean, we, we all are aware, and I hope that uh, um, also in, in Russia are aware of the uh, devastating consequences that this may uh, entail. Uh, um, for the whole, the, the whole population, eh, by the way, because then, I mean, where would you use the, uh, if in case, the, uh, the these weapons? It's, um, um, I think that um, uh, there is an element of the uh, uh, of threat and there is an element of deterrence. And uh, um, that's where I see what has been expressed by a number of uh, um, um, uh, different political quarters uh, on this side and on the other side of the Atlantic about the fact that this would entail, as I said, devastating consequences for uh, um, uh, for Russia. So I hope that um, um, there is still an element of um, uh, rationality in uh, in all this process. I mean, as, as uh, much as we can uh, call it this way, and that this is not this the risk of the escalation, as you were mentioning, uh, um, uh, is more limited than uh, one could um, uh, could fear. Um, clearly, uh, one cannot exclude. Eh? I mean, the uh, the fact that this may uh, uh, may happen, may take place. Um, but again, I mean, it's a question of. Um, um, what you want to achieve and which are the uh, which is the price that you are paying for uh, um, achieving the result um, it is true that the uh, uh, this the, the war uh, which was supposed to last only a few days now uh, we are eight months into uh, uh, into it and uh, uh, i'm afraid that uh, we will see more uh, in the in the months to come, maybe uh, during the winter time it will be um, a little bit more uh, um, less uh, visible. But um, um, the the situation on the ground is still uh, uh, 
unclear and uh, mm -hmm. so both sides uh, uh, are uh, uh, not ready to uh, um, to go for uh, um, for uh, um, uh, a settlement i would like to stress one thing because this could uh, honestly while i was speaking it sounds a little bit like putting uh, um, ukraine and russia on the same plane and this is not the case i mean there is one aggressor and there is a country that has been aggressed and so um, um, i i like very much the uh, um, the uh, definition that was used by uh, the uh, Finnish foreign minister when she was asked when uh, this war would end, and she replied, "When Russia will uh, um, leave uh, Ukraine." And I think it was a very uh, uh, wise way of um, uh, putting things uh, um, in the right perspective. Indeed, um, we have a question here from for former Brigadier General Gerald Ahern, and he says. When I served with the EU training mission in Somalia in 2013-14, I often heard observations from non-military colleagues that the EAS was staffed predominantly by those from development and humanitarian backgrounds and experience. Was that a fair observation, he asks? Um... I mean, it's uh, uh, if there is someone who knows well the story of the uh, origin of DAS, it's you, David. <laughs> <laughs> you have been intimately involved in it. So uh, um, certainly, uh, at the beginning, the uh, the external action service uh, uh, was staffed essentially with uh, with uh, um, uh, colleagues coming from the institutions. Um, that said, I um, um, I think that many of those colleagues were uh, um, had a very uh, open uh, uh, vision of things, and they were not just coming with a sort of development uh, uh, mentality. Um, but the uh, the uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, the EIS has evolved uh, significantly. Uh, uh, let's say almost half of the staff now uh, is made up of, um, of national diplomat, but more than the origin uh, of the, uh, um, uh, the staff, I think that what has changed is the approach and the, uh, and the mentality of the AS as such. It has moved very much into a, a, a crisis management, uh, into a, a crisis response, and there are uh, important and uh, a very important component of the house which is dealing with uh, uh, this dimension. So um, I would say that uh, uh, by now we have a clear uh, sense of the work that uh, uh, the EIS could do, both in Brussels and in our embassies on the ground that have also uh, their the evolution uh, um, has been particularly significant and there again you are a good uh, uh, witness of, of this having been yourself leading uh, if not the most important certainly one of the most important uh, embassies in uh, of the european union in the world in washington so um, um, uh, the um, the work has changed a lot with the nature of and the characteristics that the, the EIS has taken over time. Um, we need also to be aware that uh, the EIS is still a relatively young body eh? because it's uh, it has been created uh, less than twelve years ago, and. Um, uh, let's say the complexity of the structure is such that you need some time to uh, solidify and cement a number of uh, um, elements, including the culture of the house, eh, of, the, uh, of the place, the, the, the political culture. But I think that we are, honestly, we are on, uh, on, a, on a very good track. We're getting lots of questions in, Stefano. I'm not sure I'm going to get around to them all because I know we must stop at, at 1.20. Um, just pursuing that, that issue of development aid, uh, Pauring Murphy, former Irish ambassador, says, um, you mentioned developed development aid policy. Would you agree that at a global level, our classic development aid policy has shown certain gaps in coverage which are now being exploited by China? Do we need to have a more comprehensive view of our policy in this area? You touched also on the global gateway, of course, which is yeah, horrible. and I, and I would say that the um, um, the even the, the uh, change in the uh, um, 
name of the uh, Directorate General who is dealing with development is interesting because now uh, what used to be a development cooperation has become international partnerships, yeah. which is, how to say, a, a quite important shift um, in uh, terms of approach. It's not only um, um, how to, uh, let's say, to support the, uh, um, the development of the countries, but how to make it sure that we are creating conditions in the countries of sustainable growth, but also the, uh, the link that uh, uh, this work can create between those countries and European Union. So we just don't want to be, uh, 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 let's say, bringing our support, but we want also to create a political connection, which is uh, um, stronger. I mean, from that point of view, it is very interesting to, uh, uh, to recall the recent EU-African mm -hmm. Union summit in, uh, in, in Brussels, has tried to uh, have to create a new way of um, um, uh, defining the relationship, the partnership between uh, the European Union and Africa, very much based also on what you were mentioning, uh, David, about the Global Gateway, so our interconnectivity strategy, and the idea of creating, again, uh, projects that for their relevance and impact may have a, a significant impact on the uh, economic development of the country and also as i was saying generating a, a stronger political link with uh, um, with uh, the european union thank you um we have exactly four minutes left i'm going to we're still i'm going to throw you three questions uh Stephanie. Okay. <laughs> um not all of them easy but you can then choose <laughs> how much time you spend on each of them the first one is from peter McLoon, um uh who is a board member of the iea and he's just saying we it's just been announced that we have a new prime minister uh, in the uk most likely uh rishi shunak uh, do you have any immediate thoughts on, on how that future relationship will develop? So that's one question. The second uh, relates to the country that you know best in, in our best European speak, Bobby McDonough, um, uh, all distinguished Irish diplomat, but also former ambassador to Rome. Um, the new Italian uh, prime minister, despite divisions in her coalition, has promised solidarity with the EU and the Ukraine. How confident are you of Italy's position? I don't know. If, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough question there from Bobby. Um, and to what extent is populism in the EU being constrained by the reality of national interests and public opinion? And then finally, um, uh, an Irish question. We, 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 you touched on on the, the defence role uh, of the EU, um, the the fact that you know Finland and and Sweden have now joined NATO. Um, Ireland remains something of an outlier. The debate here um, is not really showing any enthusiasm for NATO, um, perhaps more openness to the European uh, co to cooperating on, on European defence activities, but. Um, just your thoughts on how Ireland is perceived, uh, how the Irish position is, is perceived by, by, by the other member states. Thank you. So you've got uh, okay. three, minutes, three minutes to come <laughs> question. Uh, no, no pressure. Okay. 50, 50 seconds each. Um, uh, new premise in UK. I mean, I, I, we, I think that we all hope that uh, um, UK will uh, um, get out of this very complex political uh, um, situation where they are and um, can uh, um, go back to uh, the whole habits of predictability uh, of being a, a reliable partner for the all of us. We have had um, uh, difficult moments. Uh, I have to say that in, in the area that I'm uh, more involved in, uh, security and defense, we have had a very good cooperation with UK um, um, in all these months, in spite of the problems and the difficulties. But I think that the, uh, um, for the uh, first of all, for the uh, UK citizens, and then for the rest of the European uh, and for the rest of the world, we are certainly willing uh, um, to have a more stable situation, political situation in the, the UK. Um, um, on the point of uh, uh, the country and no best, I mean, there is a very good uh, golden rule of not commenting on uh, the uh, um, countries of members of the European Union. Uh, but I have to say that uh, uh, from uh, what I'm seeing uh, um, uh, in terms of choices and also in terms of uh, 
um, um, concrete acts that have been taken by uh, uh, the new government. Uh, um, I, I think that uh, there is at least um, a, a good basis on which one could um, um, could uh, uh, could work on, and uh, um, and I won't say more about this. Um, about the uh, the point of uh, um, the role of the, the uh, Ireland, and I think that Ireland has has been and continues to be. An extremely um, um, uh, reliable uh, uh, partner, and um, um, I'm not saying this only for because I'm, I'm sitting in Dublin, um, but because the I've seen concretely uh, um, even in areas which were difficult in decisions that were difficult to be made by Ireland, then the, the instinct has been that of. Uh, supporting the uh, European unity. I'm thinking in particular now in this moment the European peace facility, which could have been a difficult uh, uh, decision to be taken um, and where uh, Ireland could have been uh, um, I don't know, difficult in, in, in joining the consensus and they have done so, they've done the, in a very constructive spirit and they continue to work in a very constructive spirit in, in this area. I think that um, um, it is important for me uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, have in mind that when we speak about security, not only in Europe, but the new concept of security, it goes well beyond the military aspect and the military element. There is also a, uh, 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 many other uh, components that come into the picture. Uh, be it on uh, misinformation or cyber, on hybrid space, uh, you name it. And in all these areas, uh, um, we need a strong European Union. That's where uh, also the, the point that I'm constantly making with the colleagues in NATO, uh, if, they, uh, if they are strong when it comes to hard security, I think that we are strong as European Union when it comes to uh, this other aspect of security. Eh? And that includes uh, energy or the, the work on the instrumentalization of many policies that is being done by, uh, by Russia, in, uh, uh, for example, during this war. So in all this, I think that we can all contribute, and the European Union can give a huge contribution, and Ireland can give a huge contribution for the security of uh, all our continent and of the Irish people. Thank you very much. We're, we've run slightly over time, so I apologize for that. But thank you so much, uh, Stefano Sanino, Secretary General of the European External Action Service, for joining us today. And, and good luck with uh, the many challenges that your role faces in the future. Thank you so much.